All right, welcome everyone to our last seminar of the year from uh, Roland Crocker from the ANU. Um, so uh, many of you in the audience I know uh, will, will know Roland. So Roland is one of our, our local experts on uh, high energy astrophysics. Um, so, so Roland did his PhD uh, at, at Melbourne before holding positions um, at Melbourne and Adelaide and Heidelberg um, before his, his current position at, at ANU. Um, so yeah, Roland is a, is a real expert on, on this stuff that he's, he's going to be telling us about today. And this is, I, I already know, is, is some very, very exciting work. Um, so hopefully you will, you will enjoy this uh, last seminar of the year. So thanks, Roland, for uh, agreeing to uh, tell us about this and, and take it away. Thanks, Karen. That's, that's very kind. Um, so uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to um, interrupt with a question, because um, I, I, I don't think I've got uh, material that will um, last for more than about half an hour or so of slides. Uh, so I'm very happy to take questions um, during the talk. Um, yeah, so this is um, a discovery that we think we've made of a gamma ray emission from uh, the Sagittarius dwarf toroidal galaxy. Um, so hopefully this works. Right, so this is, um, this work is in, in currently in submission. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my co-first author, um, uh, Oscar Macias, who is um, at Grappa uh, and is responsible uh, for the, um, uh, the Fermi uh, gamma ray data analysis for this, um, for this work. And then uh, big uh, contributions also from um, Dougal and uh, Mark at, um, from ANU. And then uh, many other uh, names, um, both um, local and international that you, you might might know there in the um, in the author list. Okay, so just to set the scene, um, this is the uh, the gamma ray sky as uh, seen by the, the Fermi uh, instrument. Um, so this is NASA's um, orbiting gamma ray telescope, uh, and what you're seeing here is um, uh, gamma rays um, with a characteristic energy of around about uh, a giga electron volt, um, and this is in galactic coordinates. Um, so uh, the, uh, the feature which is running horizontally across the middle uh, of the image is the galactic plane. And um, the most of the emission here that, that you see is, um, is actually diffuse. Uh, and it's coming from the um, impacts of uh, hadronic cosmic rays, mostly protons, um, uh, with gas nuclei. So um, hadronic interactions that lead to um, uh, neutral mesons, which then decay into gamma rays. So that's the dominant source of, of, of gamma ray emission that, you, that we see from the sky, um, you know, the local uh, and, and more distant uh, galactic plane. Uh, so this is a, an interesting image. Uh, you can see other, other, other sources, of course, there are, there are point sources located off, off the plane, which these, these are mostly blazars. Uh, and there are a few star forming galaxies and, and things as well. And then there are the point sources in the plane, which are things like pulsar wind nebulae and, and um, uh, supernova remnants. Anyway, um, fairly soon after the, the Fermi instrument was launched, um, an independent group of um, uh, researchers uh, using Fermi data um, were able to extract off um, uh, all of these uh, well characterized uh, signals, including this um, strong diffuse um, gamma ray emission from the plane of the galaxy, and, and end up with a residual. Um, this, this is, and these things were called the Fermi bubbles. They were discovered by um, Sue uh, Fink, Biner, and, and Slatia um, uh, more than ten years ago. And you know, there's an ongoing uh, debate about the, uh, the the mechanism which is responsible um, for these structures. And I'm not going to be talking really about uh, what's generating the Fermi bubbles, but they're associated with activity in, in the center of the galaxy. Um, this is just to set the scene here. Um, now, fairly soon after the initial paper um, by um, uh, Sue and um, a couple of years later, um, uh, Sue and Finkbeiner did, did further uh, work on the um, uh, substructure uh, that they um, thought that they could see within the Fermi bubbles. And this is to provide a sort of historical context for what I'm talking about today. Uh, and they generated uh, this, these templates here um, so this is not raw data. This is the, this is the, uh, these are templates um, constructed um, by Sue and Finkbeiner to trace uh, the substructure uh, within the Fermi bubbles. And um, in the, this 2012 paper, they uh, claimed 
uh, the discovery of these two, uh, two counter propagating features. Um, so the, this cocoon feature um, in the south and then uh, a counter propagating uh, jet feature uh, in the north. And, and Sue and Finkbeiner um, uh, argued that this was evidence that the Fermi bubbles are being inflated by some sort of AGN activity within the Milky Way. So these are sort of gamma ray uh, emitting uh, AGN jets launched by the supermassive black hole at, at Sagittarius um, A star. So subsequent work uh, on the Fermi bubbles um, by other groups, including the Fermi collaboration, um, has um, shown again recovered the cocoon feature basically. So this is this is a, seems to be a real feature. It's it's discovered by multiple groups using different uh, multiple different analysis techniques. Uh, but basically, other groups have not been able to uh, recover the, the jet feature with any statistical confidence. So um, there's some sort of big question mark over with, whether the, jets, the jet feature is, is real, but the cocoon seems to be real. Anyway, so I, I was aware of this work. Um, and then some, some years ago, um, I happened to see an image in a, in a paper, uh, which was um, looking at some uh, early um, results uh, obtained with... Um, uh, Gaia data uh, on um, RR Lyrae stars. Um, and um, the uh, authors of this uh, particular uh, paper uh, wanted to recover a good model for the, the bulge, the stellar bulge of the Milky Way. Uh, and as part of that, um, they had identified stars, uh, RR Lyrae stars in the Gaia data that were basically along the line of sight towards uh, um, the bulge of the Milky Way, but didn't belong to the bulge. Where in fact, um, for instance, stars uh, well on the other side of the bulge and associated with a satellite galaxy called the, um, the Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal. So I'm just gonna fade out the, uh, this uh, gamma ray template here and um, bring up that other image, which was uh, uh, produced by Iorio and, and Belokarov. So these are the R.R. Lyrae stars. Um, th this is basically the noise that they were filtering out um, in, uh, in constructing their stellar model uh, of the bulge. And what you see clearly is, uh, is the core of the, um, the Sagittarius uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxy and the beginnings of the, the leading and trailing arms of, 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 that, of that structure. And you can also see, by the way, um, the large Magellanic Cloud and small Magellanic Cloud uh, are our Lyrae uh, populations um, from this, um, and I've I've rather naughtily le left off the citation here, but it's Iorio and Belikarov. Belikarov. Um, anyway, so having seen these images and and just done the dumbest thing possible and and, and overlaid them in 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 Keynote, I thought, my gosh, is is could there be an association between these things? Um, and uh, anyway, so that that prompted a, a, a quite a few years of work. Um, not really by me, um, but by um, by um, by Oscar Macias um, doing um, complicated uh, analysis um, uh, with uh, Fermi data directly. Um, so this is an image. Uh, this is a sort of re a representation of what I've just showed you. Um, this is an image from our um, in submission paper. Um, this is a temp. This is the sort of state of the art template uh, for the Fermi bubbles uh, as defined uh, by the Fermi collaboration itself. Uh, and um, the Fermi collaboration uh, agrees that there is something, uh, a region of substructure uh, in that position and, and which they're happy to call the cocoon, um, you know, inheriting this uh, nomenclature from the Sue and Finkbeiner paper from 2012. And again, if you, I just uh, fade that image out, um, uh, this is our uh, uh, reprocessing of the, um, the Gaia data. Um, and that's again the, the Sagittarius uh, a dwarf and the Magellanic crowds um, and the Sagittarius stream. Um, so I, I guess um, the whole point of uh, the um, analysis that we've been doing over the last couple of years is to show that this isn't just a, a, a chance um, overlap. It, there really is a, a very a strong, we can, we can say with very strong statistical confidence that the gamma ray signal uh, or at least um, some part of the gamma ray signal, uh, which is called the cocoon, is actually the gamma ray emission from the Sagittarius uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxy. Um, so by the way, the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal galaxy um, was only discovered in the 90s. Um, and um, the reason is that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite close to the um, 
to the to the bulge, and it's also very close to the plane of the galaxy. So it was basically um, confused by um, uh, stars uh, in the uh, in in the Milky Way, um, and uh, um, the same reason why it was hard to see. Uh, to identify this structure in in stars was you know was is the reason I, I would say that it's been it's taken so long to discover in gamma rays. In fact, the Sagittarius dwarf. I mean, I'll, I'll say this later, but the Sagittarius dwarf is basically uh, the, the 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 structure uh, with the bright well with the largest um, value of uh, total uh, stellar mass divided by distance squared that we haven't yet uh, that hasn't yet been uh, discovered in in gamma rays and, until our paper. Uh, all right, so um, from our uh, uh, Oscar's uh, analysis um, with the, the, the standard analysis that we do, uh, when we in, incorporate a template, um, which is defined by the, um, by the stars of, of the Sagittarius dwarf uh, in the um, uh, gamma ray an analysis chain, um, then we get a very, very significant um, uh, improvement of the likelihood. and um, it corresponds to an 8.1 uh, sigma statistical uh, significance for the for the discovery, um, and we've tried um, various things, uh, including uh, using uh, different um, alternative but um, you know motivated uh, versions of the of the templates uh, which describe gamma ray emission from other structures or um, objects within the, in, in the Milky Way itself, uh, and. Um, and we still always get a, a, a detection at, at well better than five sigma. Um, in fact, if we, uh, and, and for these analysis uh, analyses here, what we're actually doing is we're actually using that structured uh, Fermi bubble uh, template, which I showed uh, earlier on, the, the one defined by the Fermi bubble. Um, and our strong suspicion is that, that, that this structured Fermi bubble template is actually soaking up uh, a good deal of the, the gamma ray emission, which really belongs to the Sagittarius dwarf. Um, in this situation, the standard procedure is actually to use a, a completely flat template um, for the for the Fermi bubbles, or uh, you know, an analogous structures in other sorts of uh, discovery claims. If we use a, a completely flat, um, that is a uniform uh, surface brightness template for the Fermi bubbles, uh, and we and we perform the same um, gamma ray uh, data analysis, then uh, the um, uh, the Sagittarius dwarf is recovered at even uh, higher significance, up to 19 sigma. All right, so we we claim this uh, as very good, um, uh, a very good evidence that we have actually detected um, uh, gamma ray emission from this uh, dwarf spheroidal uh, galaxy. Okay, um, so that then um, you know <laughs> begs a question, which is you know what is responsible uh, for this um, gamma ray emission? Um, so. Um, this is a, indeed an interesting question. Um, the dwarf um, does not have any um, associate, there's no associated uh, gas um, with the dwarf. This has been lost to, to tidal and ram pressure stripping. This is convincingly shown actually by um, some nice and body simulations by um, uh, Tor and uh, Joss a few years ago. Uh, it has so it has no gas, and, and that gas has been stripped off by by, by tidal effects and ram pressure stripping as the as the uh, the dwarf's um, orbit has taken it through uh, various crossings of the of the plane of the Milky Way, and the fact that it's been denuded completely of its of its gas means that it, it can't um, produce any new uh, populations of stars, and in fact, star formation finished significant star formation finished two or three um, billion years ago, um, and, and this has the um, the implication that the gamma ray emission from the dwarf uh, can't be this hadronic emission, that, um, which, uh, as I was saying uh, earlier in the talk, is, is dominating the gamma ray, uh, the total gamma ray luminosity of the, for instance, the Milky Way. Um, there are neither, there's neither any 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 gas targets with which a, a putative uh, cosmic ray population can collide, uh, and and nor is there any you know star formation to produce the uh, the populations of a core collapse supernovae, um, which in the Milky Way and, and other star forming galaxies produce, you know, the shocks in the interstellar medium, which accelerate uh, cosmic ray hadrons. Uh, so it's not hadronic gamma ray emission. Oh, this is just a reminder that the hadronic gamma ray emission is what you know, is what is dominating in, in the Milky Way, but it's it's not what we're seeing here from the Sagittarius dwarf. Um, and 
I mean, the, the other effect, of course, is that the signal is actually tracing the stars of the dwarf with, with one proviso, which I will um, expand on below. Uh, and anyway, the fact that the signal traces the stars of the dwarf um, and is, is strongly concentrated on the core, uh, we think implies that it's not a dark matter signal because uh, the same in-body simulations I've referred to before uh, show that the, the tidal effects of the, you know, the weakly bound uh, uh, dark matter halo um, draw the dark matter out into these um, into the into the into the uh, Sagittarius stream. I should have said, by the way, earlier on that the Sagittarius uh, stream, uh, you know, which is the population of stars, you know, and dark matter, though because we don't see the dark matter, but the population of stars which has been tidally stripped off the dwarf, that wraps around the sky a couple of times. So it's a, it's a, actually a sort of a uh, it's a huge structure um, on 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 the sky plane. Uh, and more or less, um, the, these tidal effects will, will pull the dark matter out into those into that into that stream, and that's not the morphology of the structure that we see. We see a we see a, a structure which is 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 tracing the, the stars of the core. Um, and and so we think that the, basically the only um, uh, credible explanation left is that the uh, gamma ray emission uh, is produced by something called um, or some things called millisecond pulsar. So these are uh, uh, neutron stars, uh, rapidly spinning neutron stars uh, with um, rotational periods of, uh, of a few um, milliseconds or, or larger. Um, and well, uh, why, why do we think this? I mean, um, individual millisecond pulsars fairly close to the Earth are actually uh, seen in gamma rays um, uh, by the Fermi instrument. And uh, there are known situations where uh, um, uh, populations of millisecond pulsars uh, dominate or you know, completely dominate the, the gamma ray luminosity of, of certain old uh, stellar populations. So for instance, a number, uh, quite a few uh, globular clusters uh, are uh, detected as point sources in uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi data. Uh, and um, that those uh, gamma ray signals are due to millisecond pulsars um, belonging to the, the globular clusters. Um, this uh, inter interesting um, uh, work, um, uh, somewhat controversial, um, about uh, the gamma ray emission from the uh, bulge of the Milky Way itself. Um, this is a signal called the galactic center excess. Um, and I, you know, for, for full disclosure, I, I, I'm uh, actively part of this debate, so I have my own, my own ideas about this. Um, but um, at least I would claim that the galactic center excess signal associated with the bulge of the Milky Way is also a, a signal connected to the, um, the millisecond pulsar population of the bulge. Uh, and similar claims have been made about M31, the Andromeda, the nearest um, large spiral galaxy. Um, anyway, so we have some strong a priori reasons to think that uh, millisecond pulsars um, uh, can um, produce gamma rays. Um, and um, uh, what's interesting, uh, what, what, what makes them uh, also um, an interesting um, a prospect um, as the potential source of gamma rays in the Sagittarius Dwarf is that they remain uh, gamma ray emitters for uh, time scales of typically uh, well over a billion years. And of course, such a signal uh, would broadly be expected to trace the stars, the, the, uh, the underlying population which has birthed uh, those, um, um, those millisecond pulsars. Uh, on the other hand, um, at first sight, the spectrum that we see from Sagittarius is you know, more or less completely wrong um, as a potential uh, millisecond pulsar signal. Uh, so this, uh, this is actually the spectrum that, Sorry. that we measure. Rolling. Sorry. Yeah. Um What's, what's the, the general mechanism for the gamma ray emission from the millisecond pulsars that we've observed directly? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, ex I'll explain more of that, but, but it's a com well, so the, yeah, let, let me, uh, let me just um, uh, explain that in the next couple of slides. And if I haven't answered yeah. the question, I'll, I will come back yeah, to yeah. it. Sure. All right. So essentially the, um, uh, the, the spectrum of the Sagittarius dwarf is, is more or less described here uh, so these are the data points. And if you see this um, uh, dashed black line here, it's a, an e to the minus 2.1 uh, type uh, uh, power law distribution. The uh, sort of the classic uh, spectrum that we see from um, 
uh, from millisecond pulsars is is strongly peaked at a, at a couple of GeV. It has a sort of a, a GeV bump, and then a, a then a and then a fast uh, exponential uh, decline uh, towards you know energies approaching say 10, 10 GeV or so. And that that emission. Well, I'll, I'll explain as I as, as I say more. Um, all right. Um, now the other thing, the other the, the other worry about this idea that the um, gamma ray emission um, from the um, the Sagittarius dwarf roidal could come from millisecond pulsars is that the thing is just so damn bright. Um, it's got a gamma ray luminosity per stellar mass, uh, which is much higher than at least um, some other cases uh, where we think um, gamma rays, uh, sorry, where we think that millisecond pulsars are, are, are dominating the gamma ray budget. Uh, it's something like 10 times uh, more luminous per stellar mass than these other systems. For instance, uh, the, the galactic center excess in excess slash um, uh, Milky Way uh, bulge. Uh, so this is just to, to, to show that. Um, so here the um, Sagittarius total uh, data point um, is the uh, gamma ray luminosity uh, per stellar mass of the of the Sagittarius signal, which we which we detect. And, the, and there are those um, objects to the right. That's um, the yellow thing, which is called uh, NB. That means the nuclear bulge. That's a, a substructure within the bulge of the Milky Way. Um, which um, arguably also has um, uh, gamma ray emission uh, from uh, dominantly from uh, millisecond pulsars, the bulge, which I've described, um, and the disk, um, and then M31, Andromeda, the nearest uh, spiral galaxy. Uh, on the other hand, um, the, on, the, on the left hand side in, in the blue, so these, these are all um, uh, organized by total stellar mass, M star, in, in solar masses. You see lots of globular clusters, and they can be significantly more bright uh, per unit stellar mass than, than Sagittarius. Um, okay, so what, what is the signal? Um, and hopefully I'm answering your question, Kieran, but very, very, very gradually. <laughs> um, so uh, there's something un, you know, quite odd about Sagittarius in, in terms of, um, of comparing uh, its situation with other other. Uh, stellar objects uh, from which we detect gamma ray emission. And that is, again, the fact that there's no gas in the system. Uh, and and that, that means that we expect that there to be basically a vanishingly small um, uh, magnetic field uh, associated with that galaxy, uh, or at least a magnetic field which is uh, much, much smaller uh, in energy density than the light field. Uh, and, um, you know, the Sagittarius is, um, the galaxy is populated by this um, old population of, of, of you know, sort of intermediate age stars, and they're fairly sparse. Uh, and, and so it turns out that actually, the, in fact, the dominant interstellar radiation field, UISRF, which I've uh, labeled there, is actually the cosmic micro background radiation. That is the, the dominant um, uh, uh, light field in the Sagittarius Dwarf, and it has an energy density which is much, much larger than the energy density in any um, reasonable magnetic field that the dwarf could have, given that there's no way to anchor a magnetic field into, into the gas in the galaxy because there isn't any gas. All right, so this has the consequence that if there were a population of cosmic ray electrons and positrons being produced by some source in the dwarf, then basically all that can happen to that population is that it radiates uh, via the inverse Compton mechanism uh, off the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and um, it basically doesn't do any, or it doesn't a negligible amount of, for instance, synchrotron radiation, this population, this putative population of electrons and positrons, um, because, um, because the magnetic field energy density is so much smaller than the, uh, the light field uh, energy density. And this is, uh, this is in, 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 in very um, stark contrast, contrast to the situation uh, for most other, um, uh, stellar environments which host MSP, uh, millisecond pulsars, you'll typically have uh, magnetic fields which are uh, similar or, or even larger in, in terms of energy density than the, than the light field. And in such situations, then you, you divert a lot of the power uh, going into electrons and positron, uh, cosmic electrons and positrons into synchrotron radiation uh, rather than inverse Compton radiation. But um, why, why do I suddenly bring up this, 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 this cosmic ray electron positron population anyway? Well, there has to be such a population uh, if, you, if you're seeing um, uh, this characteristic 
uh, emission um, uh, from millisecond pulsars. That emission, uh, and this is uh, now finally answering uh, uh, your question, Karen. That emission is curvature radiation. So it's the uh, it's the radiation which is um, being produced um, within the magnetosphere uh, of the uh, of the millisecond pulsars by electron positron pairs as they as they curve around and are accelerated around uh, the field lines, and the physics uh, of that uh, of that process, uh, and the fact that we see a peak in G the energies means that we can actually work out what the spectrum of the of the population within the, the, the cosmic ray electron positron population within the magnetosphere. We can we, we can work out what the spectrum of that population has to be, uh, and that spectrum um, uh, has to carry on up to energies of a, of a few TeV. Okay. So the usual situation is that uh, in, in a millisecond pulsar, you've got uh, processes, uh, pair production processes occurring in the magnetosphere. Uh, the pairs um, produce uh, a curvature radiation. The curvature radiation um, uh, peaks at, at, at in the GeV energy, and that's the sort of classic GeV bump signal that we see from uh, millisecond pulsars. However, um, many of those pairs will go on to escape from the magnetospheres and then be launched into the interstellar medium around, um, around an, an MSP. Um, and this is why I went through the whole rigmarole talking about the fact that the, in, in Sagittarius, the, uh, the magnetic field is very weak in comparison to the light field. So in, 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 the, in, the, in the plane of the Milky Way, for instance, these pairs that escape from the millisecond pulsars, um, they're... Uh, um, the, the power being uh, that's going into those uh, pairs is, is shared between synchrotron radiation and, in, and inverse Compton radiation. Um, but as I was describing in, in the Sagittarius dwarf, there's, there's no magnetic field. And so the pairs that escape from the millisecond pulsars, all that can happen to them is that they produce inverse Compton radiation. Uh, and we know um, a lot about the spectrum of those pairs because we can, uh, you know, we can uh, see the, the, well, we can fit, uh, we can fit a, a, a prompt or magnetospheric um, uh, component, as I'll, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, to the lower, lower part of the Sagittarius spectrum. Uh, anyway, the, this characteristic energy, the maximum energy of these pairs at a few TeV means that the inverse Compton radiation um, uh, from the pairs, once they're launched into the, uh, into the, into the insular environment, uh, will peak at about 100 GeV um, off the CMB uh, photon background. And that's exactly what we need. We need, we need to explain a gamma ray mission um, covering this range of just below a GeV to you know, just above 100, 100 GeV. Uh, and in fact, we can self-consistently relate um, everything. Um, that is the spectrum uh, of the pairs within the magnetospheres uh, producing the curvature radiation uh, to the cooled spectrum of the pairs once they leave the environment of the magnetosphere and do their inverse Compton radiation uh, in the interstellar medium. And so what, you, what we get basically is a combination of two uh, different radiation mechanisms. It's the magnetospheric uh, curvature radiation and self-consistently the same population once they leave the environment, the, the magnetosphere of the MSPs and launched into the environment of the Sagittarius dwarf it produces inverse Compton radiation up to about 100 or 200 uh, GeV, and and with this with this with this mechanism in mind, um, we get a very very good fit uh, to the spectrum, uh, a chi squared per degree of freedom, um, which is about 0.7. Um, and well, sorry, can, there I, may can be... I just make sure I, sure I understand that 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 previous plot um, from from the previous discussion? I was I, I would have expected the right hand peak to be a lot more significant just by the language that you're using but they it seems like the emission is kind of comparable in these two different effects is that what you expect or? yes well it's a it's a there is a, a there is essentially a free normalization um uh which is you know basically the yeah so so okay so ultimately the the uh, the, the 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 luminosity of the signal of the total signal is bound by the spin down uh, the, the spin down power of the millisecond pulsar. So um, there's magnetic dipole breaking of the, of the neutron star. So um, its kinetic energy is is um, is um, is radiated in 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 this accelerating this population of freshly 
sorry, in, in producing this population of electron positron pairs within the magnetosphere. And then, then, then those pairs do the some combination of curvature radiation and then inverse Compton radiation. So there is a there is a free parameter basically, which is the, the fraction um, of the uh, of the spin down power, which is lost as uh, this uh, curvature radiation component within the magnetosphere, and then the, and then basically the remaining fraction um, uh, of the power is in the pairs, which is then launched in in, in silver medium. Um, so people argue about uh, exactly what uh, you know what say for instance what the typical fraction uh, of the um, of the spin down power that's radi radiated in this prompt signal is, but empirically, um, uh, you know, because we can actually measure the um, uh, the spin down power of you know you know ne some nearby millisecond pulsars and, and actually measure the gamma ray luminosity, what you find is that of order of you know, one or ten percent or so of the spin down power is in, ends up in this prompt signal. Um, so up to ninety, you know, sort of ninety percent or so of, of that. Um, of the power is, can then be um, launched into the inverse Compton signal. Uh, and that's more or less what we find. I mean, the inverse Compton signal is much broader. Um, so we're not, we're not measure, we don't have a bolometric measurement of the inverse mm -hmm. Compton signal here because it actually extends uh, to considerably lower energy. It's just, it's just um, uh, yeah. below that, but below that prompt bump there. So some, uh, here, I, th I forget what the exact number is, but I don't know, I think it's, uh, we see between a factor of a few and 10 times the, um, uh, a few and ten times the prompt luminosity is is in the inverse Compton signal here from the from the fitting, and that's completely reasonable according to um, you know the uh, our empirical um, um, data on on other MSPs. Uh, it's just that you know the, the usual, um, and what I'm saying is that it, it, the, often the situation will be um, uh, for MSPs in other environments that this power which is going into the escaping pairs it's, it's essentially invisible because it's actually lost to synchrotron radiation mm. and the synchrotron peak is actually in the optical wavelengths um you know so so you you, you might in principle measure a, a, a radio part of that synchrotron uh, bit but the most of the synchrotron will will actually end up uh, peaking uh, in optical wavelengths and it'll just be completely um you know overwhelmed by thermal radiation essentially so mm. the usual situation for millisecond pulsars uh, is that we don't get a good measurement of the total energetics of the system, and, and what I'm, you know, what, one of the, the remarkable things about the Sagittarius Dwarf is that it's such a clean environment. As I said, all that can happen to these pairs is that they, is that they lose their energy. Um, you know, the pairs that escape the MSPs, all that can happen is that they lose their energy to uh, to inverse Compton uh, off the cosmic micro background radiation. There's nothing else that can happen to them, basically. Mm -hmm. Actually, before, um, before you go on, sorry, the, the one yeah. thing I just wanted to check. So they, when you were showing the plot of the, the luminosity per, per stellar mass, yeah. um, that, that downward trend that you see there, is, is that just gas, basically, that, that's causing that? Well, there, there could be quite a number of effects here. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so, yes, that, that I mean, magnetic fields could be part of it. Um, but there are, yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely confounding effects. So, for instance, for globular clusters, uh, it's known that they seem to be particular, I mean, they're particularly efficient, for instance, at producing uh, low mass X ray binaries. Um, something like 100 times more efficient than field star populations. Uh, and it's claimed, uh, well, so low mass X ray binaries um, might, might be a, um, a an evolutionary stage for, for binaries or for some binaries at least, which go on to produce millisecond pulsars. Uh, and it seems like in general, globular clusters are also more efficient at producing millisecond pulsars than field star populations. Uh, and the idea that's been around for a very long time is that that is an effect, that, that is a dynamical effect. Um, so there are, you know, three body, four body interactions going on in globular clusters, which um, you know, actively modify um, the characteristics of the binary of the binaries, and um, and and they make um, uh, they they modify binaries in such a way. These dynamical effects uh, they modify binaries in such a way as to, as to make um, the production of of millisecond pulsars more likely than in field star populations. Um, and now that dynamical effect is not is not. In any way significant in Sagittarius, the, the 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 stellar density is much too low for that. 
Um, but another potential effect could be associated with metallicity. Um, so the globular clusters, of course, are, are low metallicity systems and Sagittarius is relatively low metallicity. It's got a, like something like a 10th solar metallicity. Uh, and there's some evidence that the efficiency with which um, stellar populations produce um, millisecond pulsars uh, increases in the direction of, of, uh, of declining uh, metallicity. It's because it's, it, well, it's because the, uh, there, there are a couple of different effects, but um, you know, one is that um, certain uh, uh, more massive stars have a weaker stellar winds and they retain more of their envelope material. And that means that they can have, uh, they can, you, you know, you can get a common um, envelope with your binary companion um, at a larger binary separation. So basically, you know, there's a, there, there are a larger set of parameters, was a larger part of the, uh, of the um, parameter space for the, for the binary population, which will end up produ producing a, a millisecond pulsar because of the low, low metallicity. And that, that could also be an effect in this, in this diagram as well. So, you know, for instance, the bulge M31, these are both very high metallicity systems, um, probably, um, you know, you know, at least solar and, and, and maybe super solar. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, good. Yeah, yeah, please go on. Yeah. Uh, all right, um, where did I get to? Um, so yeah, so we think we, we think we can make a very good explanation for the, the, the particular spectrum that we see. Um, okay, so the, the, the one um, uh, provisor that I mentioned before, I, sorry, I was claiming that basically the gamma ray signal um, is tracing the stars. Now, so as part of the um, a, a, a part of the testing the um, the robustness uh, of the um, of our claims to have, you know uncover this signal, um, uh, Oscar did uh, did an exercise where he systematically displaced the stellar template away from its true position. And when he did, uh, and he did other things like he tested he tested rotating the signal, and we found that the um, you know, we, we get the the, uh, the best fit, basically uh, a strong peak in in, uh, in for the best fit uh, for for the true um, orientation of the template. But what he does find is that uh, he gets an improvement um, uh, if he displaces the template uh, four degrees to the south of the true position of the dwarf. All right. Now this so this corresponds to a distance of about two kiloparsecs uh, at the position. Uh, of, of the Sagittarius dwarf, it's and this is a this is a four and a half sigma effect. So it's it's probably it's probably a real effect. Um, so one explanation of this effect could just be um, because we're using this uh, structured template of the Fermi bubble. So um, um, and you know we're not we're not actually claiming that there's no structure at all in the Fermi bubble. So there there could be a confusion between. Uh, the real structure of the Fermi bubbles, which we don't have a good sort of a priori model of, uh, and, and the Sagittarius dwarf. Um, but the other thing, um, the other thing to, to note here is that if you look at the displacement uh, of this, um, the way that this, this signal, uh, that the fit improves if you displace the signal, um, then the, you, you, we get the best improvement um, uh, for a displacement directly to, more or less directly to the south of the true position of the dwarf. And the dwarf is actually heading more or less directly north in this diagram uh, in, in, in galactic coordinates. And so um, it's, it's completely reasonable, at least I, I'm claiming, that um, be, because we're seeing this large inverse Compton component, um, what is actually happening is that the electron positron pairs being launched by the millisecond pulsars are being dragged out in a, in a, um, a behind the dwarf. Um, and uh, they can easily reach the sort of uh, size scale of, of um, uh, two kiloparsecs uh, over the loss times, um, in off, uh, as 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 um, informed by the um, the inverse Compton rate, uh, the inverse Compton energy losses of the CMB. So this this I mean the positive spin on this displacement is that it's actually evidence um, for gamma ray emission uh, from a population, an ISM population of cosmic ray electrons and positrons, which is being displaced. Um, uh, as the as the dwarf plunges through the the halo gas of the Milky Way. Okay, so uh, the claim here is that you know we we've basically explained this cocoon feature or largely explained the cocoon feature 
Um, and so this removes any residual motivation for the idea that that feature is evidence for a, a gamma ray jet from the, from the nucleus inflating the, the Fermi bubbles. Um, so there are quite a few, if we, if we, you know, if we believe all of this, um, then there are some interesting implications actually. So what, one is that the, um, uh, we have to think carefully about um, uh, astrophysical backgrounds um, to dark matter searches in, in dwarf spheroidals, particularly ones where there are, there are more massive stellar populations. So I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe you wouldn't choose to look for dark matter in Sagittarius dwarf anyway, um, but you know, one, uh, we need to you know, run some numbers on other dwarf spheroidal systems and, and see what the size of the, the predicted background is. Um, uh, this suggests also, and, and we're doing this, that, that one uses um, uh, templates, uh, which are defined by the, the stars themselves in, an, in analyses of, of other um, uh, nearby gamma ray resolved um, stellar structures like M31 or the Magellanic Clouds uh, to probe the possible contribution of millisecond pulsars. Um, and in general, this support, supports the idea, this, this bright signal that we're seeing from Sagittarius supports the idea that the millisecond pulsars can contribute actually significantly to the energy budget uh, of uh, cosmic ray electron positron uh, acceleration or, or injection in, in low specific star formation rate systems. In fact, even in the Milky Way, um, at least at the back of the envelope um, level, uh, MSP production of, of positrons um, uh, could be, you know, quite significant. I think if, if, if I just, um, you know, do a, a fairly rough calculation. Um, so takeaway messages, um, we claim uh, very good evidence that we've detected gamma ray emission from this dwarf seroidal uh, between a, one and hundred GeV. This is the third most massive satellite uh, of the Milky Way, by the way, after the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud, which are both already detected in gamma ray. So it's not perhaps entirely surprising um, that, this, uh, that this structure does emit gamma rays. Um, but on the other hand, both LMC and SMC are actively forming stars. So um, from that point of view, maybe it is somewhat surprising. Um, um, our argument is that the signal is explained by millisecond pulsars that belong to that cell population. Uh, and this is casts some new light on, on millisecond pulsars as, as sources of uh, non-thermal radiation and particles in, in you know, particularly in low specific star, forma star formation rate uh, systems. And, uh, and all of this is to be, to, work, to be worked out in the next year or so, basically. Um, so I will uh, stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, that was yeah, really fascinating talk. Um, uh, maybe, well, I, I have plenty more questions. Maybe, maybe other people, if they have questions, they can they can shout out now. Zach, perhaps the questions that you're asking me in the Slack, you can actually ask Roland yourself, seeing as he's right here. <laughs> maybe he's shy. <laughs> oh, Zach's so shy. I know that. Sorry, I, I was just worried there were two silly questions. <laughs> My, yeah, no silly questions. Mine things, is there like a, a easy couple sentences way to understand how you actually get gamma rays out of the millisecond pulsars? Well, yeah, so, um, okay. So you, you have a rotating uh, structure, which is highly magnetized. Um, so you have a, an effectively a, a, an electric field, which rips electrons off the surface of the, pul of the, of the pulsar. Um, and then um, those uh, electrons um, uh, interact with the, uh, with the magnetic field and, and they pair produce. Uh, and you get a cascade of electron positron pairs being produced within the magnetosphere. And then the, magnet and then the electron positron pairs, um, they, they follow the field lines, but the field lines are, are, are curved um, on, on, you know, with, a, with a radius of curvature of something like 30 kilometers. Uh, you know, which is basically informed by the, you know, the radius of the, of the neutron star, which is only 10 kilometers. So basically in, 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 in a classical picture, these things are being, you have an, you have an accelerated charge as it just follows the, these curved field lines. And so that produces, that's responsible for the curvature radiation, uh, which is this GVP. And then, and then some fraction, it might be a dominant fraction. Uh, well, I mean, all of the pairs will lose some energy, but then they eventually, they, they leak out in the interstellar in um, environment. And we know that they have to be going up to about um, 
you know, energies of, of a sort of the TEV range. Uh, and then once they're in the interstellar environment, then they can do all the things that you're that you're that you know and love, like synchrotron radiation. If there were a magnetic field, or they can upscatter the ambient light into, into uh, uh, which via inverse Compton, or they could, you know, if if, if there were gas, so they could do Bremsstrahlung. But there's no gas. There's no magnetic field. I think I think the other thing we were we were confused about is this uh, term that the anchoring of the magnetic field lines. Can you? Explain oh, I again. see. Well, to sustain, um, to, yes, to for a, for the galaxy to um, to basically to hold on to its, uh, yeah. I mean, essentially, the uh, the magnetic field in in in, for instance, the the disk of the Milky Way is being is is being generated by a, a local turbulent dynamo. So. Um, uh, the um, the turbulent motions of the gas um, uh, fold the field and 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 stretch and fold the, the field and um, they bring the field up to something like equipartition with these with with the kinetic energy density of these turbulent motions. All right. Um, now, um, in an environment where you've just simply lost the gas, there's there's no way to to generate and sustain that that magnetic field anymore. So there's some, there'll be some weak magnetic field, presumably, uh, you know, associated with the uh, super alphanic motion of the um, of the of the of the galaxy um, through the halo, um, but it will be much weaker than than the um, the field in the Milky Way. Um, so the, the other thing I. Uh... I don't know if this is connected. I, I know we've, we've discussed this before, but there's this idea of the TV halos around these um, these millisecond pulsars that I've seen discussion of. Is there any connection? Because you were talking about these TV cosmic rays that you need to, to generate these, these TV gamma rays. Is there is are the TV halos connected to this story somehow? Well, I th they could be. Um, I no, but I think the TV halos are usually associated with young pulsars. Ah. Right. So. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in comparison to, so young pulsars um, in comparison are, are significantly more strongly magnetized, but also rotating uh, slower. Um, but their, their overall um, spin down luminosity is significantly larger than these millisecond pulsars. Um, so, you know, you can, you, you, you might be able to, you know, that's why you might see a TV halo around, at least in principle, you know, like Gaminga or something. It's, mm -hmm. it's got enough yeah. sufficient, it's got sufficient uh, spin down luminosity that you, you could see, you know, maybe a, a, a gamma ray, a TV gamma ray signal connected to the, uh, to the um, electron positron pairs that it's launching against the bright galactic background. Um, I think, I mean, the fact that you get, it, yeah, so, so it turns out that um, you get very similar particle spectra. So you, you yeah, so, so these things are connected in the sense that both um, uh, both pulsars and millisecond pulsars are producing uh, electron positron populations up to the TeV sort of range, um, or maybe like ten TeV or something. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, so if you've got a if you've got a more energetic light field than the CMB, then you can produce inverse Compton up to sort of TeV energies, perhaps. Um, so now someone else can jump in. Yeah, Roland, uh, I think. Um, can you repeat, please, the argument that it's not dark matter? Uh, what was? Well, it, it's it's. Um, it's a morphological argument. If, if, if when people run n-body simulations, uh, mm. you, you start off with a sort of a what seems like a reasonable dark matter halo um, uh, profile. Then, as the um, as the as Sagittarius you know orbits around in the tidal field of the Milky Way, um, the dark matter mostly gets stripped off into these into these tidal streams. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we know the streams are there because we see them in the stars, right? So we. You know, basically, you know, what we're seeing now is the remnant. Sagittarius is the remnant 
of a once much more massive galaxy. Hmm. Um, and it's only the, the most, you know, the stars which are very, very deep in, in the, uh, the gravitational potential well, which are still bound to it. It's a highly, tidally disrupted system. Um, and so, yeah, we basically just don't expect a, a dark matter signal to be, um, uh, you know, to produce this very, um, this very compact um, a signal which is sitting on top of the dwarf. Uh, and, and we can quantify that. Actually, there's a good um, an undergraduate student, uh, Thomas Fenville, um, who's working with Alan Duffy in, in Swinburne. And he's actually taking uh, Tor and, and Joss's um, end-body simulation of the dwarf and, and working out, predicting, uh, you know, what the morphology of a, of a putative dark matter signal would actually be. And it, it doesn't look like what we see, basically. It's, it's so much too diffuse. From the from like the dark matter that will be left over in the in the core of the of the door. Well, no, I mean he's he's calculating. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. In, in in principle, he's worked out what the uh, what the J factor of the of the dwarf is, but it's um, it's like ten to the ten, wh yeah, whatever the yeah. units are. Um, um, GV to the minus five or whatever. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's uh, it's actually. It's it's not a very it's not a very good target for dark matter, so yeah, it should turn yeah. out anyway. So, yeah. Um, I have another really question, which you might have answered yeah, already. Yeah. Actually, um, do do we see an excess of millisecond pulsars correlated to Sagittarius dwarf? Well, we, we, there's no. Uh, we don't see any. Um, you, you mean do we do we detect, say, for instance, uh, you know, radio radio pulsations or anything like that? Uh, no, not that I'm, I'm not that I'm aware, but I, I um, on the other hand, I don't think we'd expect to either, given um, observational factors. Um, Just too much stuff in the way. Yes. What is the reason? Um, oh, I, I think they're just not they're, they're just not bright enough, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, it, 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 uh, they're three. It's this thing is three times further away than the uh, than the galactic center, uh, and these are very old. You know, these are old millisecond pulsars with with low spin down luminosities. So, can you um, I I, I think I missed this uh, maybe at the beginning. What how? Whereabouts is the Sagittarius dwarf? I mean, because I know it's you know towards the galactic center, oh, but how far behind the galactic center is it in distance? Uh, so it's uh, uh, from memory, it's uh, twenty six kiloparsecs away from us. So and so the um, the galactic center is um, the galactic center is eight eight kiloparsecs from us. Yeah. Okay, so it's pretty it's pretty far. It's it, it, so it's just basically it's a it's a complete coincidence on our sky plane yeah. that you know we look right past the bulge through the Fermi bubbles and, and we see this thing which is in 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 the background. That's that, that's essentially what yeah. we're claiming. It's 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 just a it's just a, ch a chance association. But the but the core that you're saying it's it's a few degrees below the plane, right? So, so the dwarf isn't actually in the disc at the moment or at the edge of the No, it's not it's not uh, but it's well it depends what you call the disc, but um so um it's like 15, I think minus 15 degrees, something like that. Mm. Uh, minus 10 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so that, I mean, the, the, yeah, this, this um, you know, this, this um, uh, plot here was, was, as I said, this, this the um, uh, Iorio and, and uh, Bela Kurov were, were interested in, in filtering out stars which did not belong to the bulge. Hmm. And so they wanted, so th th these are all the stars that they were not interested in. How do you filter them so, out? Uh, well, you, 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 you from, from, from the Gaia data, you have kinematic information. So it's Gaia. Uh, okay. And also on the base, you, you can also, there are sort of, uh, there are also cuts on, on the extinction to the star as well. Um, but, you know, basically you say that this, this kinematically can't be part of the, the bulge population. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing is, it's, so these the implications of this 
I mean, you, you were saying, you're making the, the sort of statement um, that I think is quite nice that, you know, you should be using these stellar um, templates for, for doing these, these gamma ray um, these Yeah, gamma ray I mean, you can see, basically, you see um, the motivation for that in this in this plot here, right? Yeah, Look yeah, at yeah. this is SMC and LMC here, right? Yeah, but, and, um, and I guess, um, the, the, the sort of the, the place that leads me is like, you know, should, if you include this in these analysis of the, GV excess in the galactic center, I mean, is, does the picture change at all or is there just not enough emission directly in the galactic center for this to, to be contributing to that at all? No, I mean, I, I've, I've, so I've gone through the exercise and I was, we were contemplating actually making this part of the original paper um, where I, I, I show that actually you can get a, a, a very good fit um, to simultaneously to a number of objects where we think that the millisecond pulsars are contributing to the, you know, most of the gamma ray signal. So including M31 and the collective center excess. Um, you, I mean, you, you, I mean, basically what you need to account for is the fact that you have uh, stellar populations of different ages. Uh, and as I said, you've got these metallicity effects and things, but, you know, basically, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be working on this in the new year, but you can come up with a, a coherent explanation, um, which involves millisecond pulsars for, uh, for these, um, uh, for um, uh, for these systems where you see gamma ray emission, but it's a low specific star formation rate system. So I think that you know basically a lot of the M thirty one signal, for instance, the gamma ray signal can be explained with these millisecond pulsars. Mm. I mean, I'm not I'm not first person to say that, but I'll, I what I will claim is that you can make that consistent with the detection of Sagittarius and the and the and the galactic center excess as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess the, the final thing that I think wasn't super clear, and I think I can probably guess, is the when you were uh, kind of modifying the orientation of this stellar template with respect to the to the emission, and you're finding you're finding that there's like this offset, um, and you're saying mm -hmm. it's consistent with the motion of the dwarf. How do you know the motion? Is the motion of the dwarf is that just coming from the the Gaia proper motions, or is it is it coming yeah. from the, like the stream or as from, from the proper motion? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's basically it's it's more well. I mean, it's it's basically going along the in in the in the direction of the leading arm of the stream there. So it's yeah, more yeah. or less north. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. Okay. Um, that's 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 the orbit. Um, cool. So I think we, we're up to five pm. Maybe I can stop the recording.